So I am Catherine de Cristofaro. I'm a librarian with the St. Mary's County Library System in Southern Maryland. And we are so grateful to be able to have Martha Wells here to talk to us today about her writing. And I'm gonna give a brief intro, uh, more formal intro to Martha and we'll get started. So Martha Wells has been a science fiction and fantasy writer since her first fantasy novel was published in 1993. Her works include the books of the Rashgura series, The Death of the Necromancer, The Fall of the, oh Martha, I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce that one incorrectly. That's okay. The um, Isle Wren trilogy? Yeah, Ilrian. Ilrian, thank you. The Murderbot Diary series and media tie-in fiction for Star Wars, Stargate Atlantis, and Magic the Gathering, as well as short fiction, YA novels, nonfiction. She's been a Nebula Award and Hugo Award and Locus Award winner, and her works has appeared on the Philip K. Dick Award Ballot and the BSFA Award Ballot, USA Today Bestseller List, and the New York Times Bestseller List. Her books have been published in over 20, in 22 languages. And most importantly, she has agreed to talk to us today at our library. So thank you so much, Martha, for being here. We are so excited to get to talk to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, Great, right, so it's okay. I'm gonna just dive in with some questions. And let's see. So can you share a little bit about where your idea for the Murderbot Diaries came from? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I, I started working on it when, or I got the idea when I was finishing up the first draft of The Harbors of the Sun, which was the last book in the Books of the Rexora series. And I was getting a whole bunch of different ideas for things. And just the idea of a, um, a sec an enslaved security person who would have to had basically freed themselves, but was, you know, still kind of stuck where they were, who would have to reveal that to um, save people that it had started to like, um, you know, came to me. And it was so obviously a science fiction idea. And, <coughs> excuse me, I... I couldn't stop working on the book I was working on, and but I did like sit down and kind of write the scene that came to mind, which turned out to be, I was actually just going to jot down some notes and it just turned into the scene where Mensa opens the cubicle door in All Systems Red. Um, and so just like, I, I just really love this idea. Um, and as soon as I finished the fantasy novel, the next day, basically, I started working on All Systems Red. So I'm not really sure where it came from, just... Um, Probably I'd been, I've always been a science fiction reader and I've been reading things like um, Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice and books like that. So I think it was probably just kind of a little bit of the gestalt at the time. A lot of people were writing about AI then and then actually still are. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I love how your, even though your books are set in space and they do deal with, you know, the main character being an AI, all of your characters still seem very real and very down to earth. Can you talk about um, where some of these other characters came from? Where did this sort of odd group of family come from? Um, I kind of just draw character char characteristics from, um, you know, actors I've seen and people I know. It's just kind of just kind of a jumble of everything. Um, Yeah, I just don't, I don't ever like take a, you know, take someone I know or something like that and try to duplicate that person. It's always just kind sure. of, of things, but it just comes from observation, I think. Yeah. Uh, were there any that were the most fun to create or were there any that were just really difficult to figure out who they were on the page? I think the most fun are always the ones where you kind of come up with an idea for that character and their place in the story. And then as they, as the story develops, they kind of do things that surprise you. You start thinking of fun things for this character to do that you didn't originally have in mind. Rathi was kind of like that. Uh, Garathan was like that. I try, especially in Murderbot, I was trying to not make any one person the bad guy. You know, there were, I wanted, you know, people to be um, antagonists, basically, but not villains. So, you know, keeping that in mind, I think, makes the characters more well-rounded. Absolutely. I love how Garafin, you think he's going to be just the meanest guy at the beginning, but I, I kind of love him by the time <laughs> you're done with the series. 
Um, so I read that you have a background in anthropology. Is that true? Oh yeah, I have a BA okay. in anthropology. Okay, Wikipedia did not lie to me then. Um, has this influenced your work at all in your creation um, of your societies? I think it has. It's just learning how to, uh, <clears throat> how a real society works and how a real culture works and how a real city operates at different levels of technology. I think it just, it just helps you create fantasy versions. Uh, just, it always, you know, kind of knowing, I, I used to get a lot more nuts, and even if, even if I'm fairly nuts and bolts about the way the city works and trying, and, or the setting works and trying to be very realistic. Um, I think it, and it helps to know that. And it also helps even if you're doing like a magical world where magic is taking the place of some of the, the real world systems that would be like providing food or whatever. Um, it just helps. So, um, you know, the idea of research and, and knowing the societies. I'm also wondering, did you do any research into sort of robotics or science of how murder bot could exist in this world or the other bots that are part of the society? I didn't really do a lot of research into robotics because I was writing Far Future. So yeah, you kind of want to try to keep things almost as fanciful as you can to mm -hmm. have a, a hope of trying to get ahead of, of the pace of the, of the development of modern technology. One thing I did do is I worked for a long time um, in uh, uh, computer support and also as a programmer and um, uh, building databases and doing programs for user interfaces for databases. So a lot, I think, of what informs Murderbot comes from that, from software development and software administration and database administration and that kind of thing. My software development husband is going to love that, uh, that you know, he'll feel like he's better, closer to the story. Um, so I do need to ask, is the rise and fall of Sanctuary Moon modeled after any particular show? Or do you have a, a working knowledge of what's going on in those episodes, even if we don't get to see them? Yeah, I do. And actually all the shows are modeled after you know, a real show, which helps me keep track of what's going on in them and what kind of episode Murderbot would be watching. Uh, the Rise and Fall Sanctuary Moon is um, based on, um, God, now I've lost the name. Um, oh, it's the, the one with, I date it when I do this, my brain goes blank. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. About, um, it's about, a, it's a woman lawyer who's teaching a class, uh, oh, how to get away with murder. That's it. Oh. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been, all, it's been off for a while now, for a couple of years now, I think. But, um, so it's kind of that um, mystery, suspense, drama with a lot of per interpersonal drama, but on a space colony. Uh, and also kind of bringing in what we would consider science fiction elements. That's how I imagined uh, the rise and fall of Sanctuary Moon. I love that. Um, is World Hoppers modeled after anything else? So World Hoppers is kind of a, a, along the lines of like a Stargate type series. Okay. All right. Uh, will we ever get to see like clips of the shows in the book from Murderbot's perspective? Probably not. Okay. Maybe, you know, I, I hate to say never, but... Um, sure, that's totally... I have any plans to do that right now. Just okay. I think the descriptions are even funnier. Oh, I, yeah, I love how he how he currently shares with us. Um, let's see. So the first four books in the Murderbot series are novellas, whereas book five is a more full length novel. Did you know that was? Did you plan that format, or did that? Or and did you approach the story different at all with the longer text? <laughs> The, um, I didn't plan the series at all. Originally, when I wrote All Systems Red, it was just going to be a single novella. Oh. And it became a novella because toward, originally the idea was for a short story, but it was obviously too long for that. But Tor.com had had their novella line out for about a year. So um, I thought that would be, I talked to my agent and I thought that would be a good place to try to sell it. And when they bought it, they asked for a second one. So that's when I wrote Artificial Condition. And by the time I finished it, I wanted to continue the series. And that's, I think it was when um, I kind of decided I was, wanted to keep up with it. And after the first four, um, 
I can't remember. I, I think I must have talked to my editor or something about the idea of doing a novel, and they really liked that idea. Um, and the original premise of, uh, you know, network effect was to bring art from artificial condition back into the story. And that became a novel just because I thought that's a, this is going to be a long story. It's going to take a longer time. So I wanted more time to develop it and work on that. That makes sense. So you mentioned that you thought this was going to be a short story. And I know you have many short stories published as well. How does that work in publication? Do you write them as they come to you? Are you tasked with a writing prompt and you respond to it? Uh, sometimes if you're invited to an anthology and you say yes, then there is usually a theme that you need to write to. Mm -hmm. um, most of my, I actually prefer to write novels or novellas rather than short stories. Um, sometimes something will come to me. My most recent one was The Salt Witch. It's a fantasy and it's uh, in Uncanny, it's online in Uncanny Magazine. And that one just came to me while I was actually staying at a place that I, that I, I wanted to write about. Um, and so it took me about a year to write. So they're not, they're not, it's not particularly easy for me. Some people are a lot more prolific with their short stories, but um, yeah. Um, so, and can you talk a little bit about your media tie-in novels? Um, I believe Stargate Atlantis and then Star Wars, or those, and, and Magic the Gathering as well. Yeah. Um, I actually, I was having a little bit of a career crash and I wanted to keep writing. And a friend of mine, Rachel Kane, had written a Stargate SG-1 novel. And I was just talking to her about it. And she said, you should, you should contact them because, you know, I bet you, they'd want you to write some. And I did. And I ended up writing two. And they were a lot of fun. Um, Star Wars, they actually came to, I was a huge Star Wars fan from the time I was 13 when the first movie came out. Um, and so they came to my agent to ask her if she had any clients who'd be interested in doing Star Wars novels. And I think they were looking for people who hadn't done one before. And so she asked me, and that's how I ended up doing that. Um, uh, Magic the Gathering was, again, um, they approached my agent, and um, their fantasy short stories that actually are still available on their, their Magic Story part of the website. Uh, those were a lot of fun because you're kind of working with a canon that's like almost... 40 or 50 years of canon basically and with all these different characters and all these different worlds and um and it's kind of really a team effort you get to work with other people and that was probably the most fun I had actually. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the process of getting your first book published and how you ended up becoming a full-time writer? Okay um <coughs> that was the element of fire and actually um I started out in college, I met Stephen Gould, who um, he's also a science fiction writer, and he was doing a, a workshop. And after I graduated, he was still living in town and he was doing a uh, workshopping with Laura Mixon, um, who's also another SF writer, and uh, a couple of other people. And so I started working on this novel that I'd had the idea for for quite a while. And um, I just, wrote it basically in the workshop we were meet once a month and usually I'd have a chapter you know to to take to the workshop and um about midway through Steve was approached by an agent who asked him if he was if he was looking for representation because at that point he was mostly a short story writer but he was also working on a novel at that point and um he said no, but then he passed the agent on to me and the agent read a partial of the element of fire and agreed to represent me. And um, when it was finished, he started sending it out and Tor Books was the second place he sent it and they accepted it. So it was, it was a pretty easy process. It doesn't it it didn't, it didn't feel easy in memory, but compared to some, it was a fairly easy process. Um, with publishing, basically, a lot of times, it's not making the first sale, it's staying published over the years, um, uh, which can be kind of difficult. Um, when I became a, and I was actually, most people who, especially who write genre are not um, full-time writers. Most of them have other jobs, full-time jobs. Um, in 2006, um, 
my career wasn't doing particularly well, but I had a, I had ended up in a very toxic job and I was just not being able, I'd come home and it would take me a couple hours to calm down enough to try to get some writing done. So, um, and then I had a friend of mine passed away and I kind of had a moment of, you know, life is too short. <laughs> and so I quit that job and went to writing full time, even though it was a really absolutely bad time to try to write full time. Um, but I stuck with it long enough at that um, I was finally able to sell the Cloud Roads and that kind of, that launched the, the Books of the Rex series. And that's um, basically kept me going for a long time until Murderbot just hit really big <laughs> out of nowhere. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you got there. We love that we have Murderbot now. Thank you. Um, so I know you said that a lot of your stories have just sort of come to you and you've gone from there. What is the rest of the process like for writing a book for you? The, are you an outliner? Are you a pantser? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not an out, outliner really at all. I'll, I'll outline a little bit sometimes, but I really, I'm, I guess I'm, somebody called it um, I can't remember who it was now, said it was, uh, it's being a pantser is more like a discovery writer, mm -hmm. a gardener, you're just kind of planting things and see what comes up, or you're just kind of discovering as you go along, and that's a really good description of it. Um, <clears throat> when I get an idea I feel strongly about, let's kind of go with it, and um, just push through and tell myself the story. Um, I know a lot of people do, I mean, it's, it's basically when you're writing, anything that gets you a finished piece of work is the right way to do it. And everyone's very individual in their process. Um, some people will do this very detailed outlines that are almost kind of like the storyboards people, the directors will do for movies and things like that. I think that would, if I did that, I think the, a lot of the energy in the story would go away from me because I'd already told it. Mm -hmm. uh, I like working things out as I go along. It generally means I, one of the, the things you hear for beginning, or beginning writers is basically just keep going with the first draft, never stop and go back. And that's, I'm the absolute opposite. It's like when I change my mind about something, I go back and revise it. And I do a lot of revising to the earlier bit to kind of get myself going again and build momentum as I, as I go along. Um, and it just means that instead of, a, a very uh, sketchy first draft that has a lot of holes in it. When I get to the end, my first draft is probably a, a lot more closer to a final draft and it still needs revision, but um, most everything is there. So it just kind of depends on what process works better for different people. And for me, this is just the way I've always done it and it's what works for me. Uh, what do you do when you hit a writing wall and you just can't figure out what the next step is? Sometimes that happens, it, it's, it, it can happen a lot. And a lot of times it's because I've, the version of the story in my head is, is different from what I'm doing on the page. I've just followed a convenient pathway instead of the way it actually needed to go. And some part of me realizes that. And so I just can't go on. And so I have to kind of sit there and try to work backward and figure out where I went wrong. Um, it's kind of like, and sometimes it can take a long time. It's like, I think I'm experienced enough now. I don't have nearly that kind of problem. But early on, especially my first, you know, three or four books, I'd hit a wall sometimes. It would take me a month to get past it of figuring out what I did wrong or why I was thinking of it in the wrong way. Getting a friend to kind of read what I've done so far and talk to them about it sometimes helps. Because when you're thinking, one thing I really notice is when I'm thinking out plot in my head about what's going to happen, I can just gloss over problems, you know, logistical problems, plot problems. When I'm trying to explain it to someone else, those suddenly become, you know, really apparent because you're trying to make someone else understand what you're talking about. And you realize this doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm having trouble with it. I need to figure out, you know, take that out and figure out something else. Um, so I love the diversity of your characters that make up this world. Uh, can I ask how you decided what names to use? I, I looked some of them up and I realized a lot of them are traditionally, like they are last names of 
that are common in different cultures? Um, yeah, for Murderbot, I wanted to try to give the feeling that this was a far future, you know, civilization, but it had come from Earth. And I thought, you know, when, even in the far future, it's not going to be, we're still going to have some of the same names. If we look at, uh, you know, our names now, uh, a lot of them go back, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, there's a lot of traditional names that are still, are still very popular and are mm -hmm. still used everything. So I wanted, I thought that would be the same way in the far future. These names will still be around. I did make up a few names because I thought that will, you know, that happens too. People make up names for their kids because they just like the sound or whatever. So I kind of wanted to keep that in there too. But I did want to get the feeling that, you know, somewhere in the, in their distant past was Earth. I like that. I so the, the rules and regulations for preservation are very well described in the book. And it is it modeled after a particular philosophy or historical place? It seems very real. Um, I was just trying to, um, um, a friend of mine called it the United States of Berkeley. Uh, uh, I, I was just trying to basically make it the opposite of the corporation rim. It's, and mm -hmm. the fact that it, originated in this group of people who basically escaped from a failing colony. And so they had a chance to kind of remake their society based on what they knew went wrong before. And that there was a really um, solid core of we're gonna take care of each other. We can trust, we can all trust each other because everybody is gonna be taken care of. And so that's really what it's based on. I like that. Um, so two new years a little bit. I love art. He might be my favorite, I'm sorry, it might be my favorite character. Uh, how did you come up with a transport being a full blown three dimensional character in the work? And is it how you initially imagined it's that happening? Not how I initially imagined it at all. Originally in artificial condition, art was not in it. Um, and one of the ways I, the first, All Systems Red was very easy for me to write. It just went really quickly. With the others, just because of the logistical difficulty with Murderbot, having so many point of views and being able to see so many different things and take in so many different, using so many different systems as tools. And um, it's just hard to write. So sometimes I'll write five or 10,000 words or 20,000 words and just have to go back and take most of it out. And that's kind of why I was in the middle of doing with artificial condition, because I'd gotten to a point where I realized, no, this isn't working. I need to change some things about how I'm doing it. And I thought I needed, I think I had realized I had started too far forward. I needed to show Murderbot's actual journey from uh, the space station to get to where it was. Uh, and I'd had a throwaway line about a transport that uh, used its medical setup to help Murderbot change its appearance a little bit. And I thought, well, let's actually, that's too, it really needs to be in actually in the story. So let's go back and show that. And, <coughs> excuse me, as soon as Art and Murderbot started to talk, started to interact, suddenly Art came together as this character. And it's one of those kind of surprise character things where you're writing it and it starts doing, you know, you start really coming up with ideas you didn't really have before. Um, and that's where art came from. And by the end of the story, I really, really love that character, but Murderbot had to leave at that point. And so that's really what I was thinking for the rest of the, the series is I really was trying to figure out a way to get them back together. I'm so glad you did. I was so excited when that happened. Um, it was a lot of fun to write. Yeah. So uh, I discovered Murderbot through audiobooks, and I love the narration by Kevin R. Free. Uh, were you involved at all in picking the audiobook reader? Is that something that you get a say in as an author? Um, you don't always get a say. It usually has to be in your contract. In your contract that they'll that you'll like it'll, a lot of times it'll, it's the same way with the cover. You get to consult on it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you get to make the final decision. Um, usually with the audiobook narrator, I'm not like, I'm not a art design art designer and I'm not a, 
an, a, a casting director. So, you know, I can just, I, I don't really know what to do, but so what happens usually is the casting director for the audiobook company will give you a couple of suggestions or say who they want to do it. And then you go in and look at their, um, their, their past work and, and say whether you think it's a good idea or not. Uh, that's given, in the past, it's given me a couple of chances to basically say, um, yeah, but the person for this audiobook should be a person of color, um, like in Wheel of the Infinite um, and books like that. Um, with the Murderbot Diaries, the casting director suggested Kevin R. Free, and I went and looked and went, this, this person is perfect. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, so that was basically the only part I had in that it's just basically going, yeah, this is the, he would be wonderful. So, yeah. So, um, was I, was there any discussion about whether you should have a woman read it instead or try to find a non-binary reader? I mean, I wouldn't change it, but I was just curious if that was something that did come up at all. No, because I thought, I thought he was a good choice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for um, a visual, uh, if there was a movie or a TV show or something, I think a non-binary person would be better. Mm -hmm. But that's probably not something I would get any input in at all. Sure. You know, because it's so different from movies and TV are so different. You really, even when you sell your, you sell your work to that, you just don't get any choice in that. Is there uh, many of the questions that were submitted on the Google form were, please, please, please let there be a murder bot show or movie. Um, is that something you would ever agree to if you were? Oh, yeah. um, there's, there's a company that has licensed it and they're working on oh. it, but it's so hard to get from that point to actually showing something. So I know they're still working on it and I know they're, they're making progress, but I, at this point, I don't know exactly what point they're at. Are there any particular actors that you imagined while coming up with any of the, just like uh, physically any of the characters or is that just, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's how your your vision works when you're thinking. Yeah, characters. sometimes it does. For Murderbot, it didn't, it didn't really for actual Murderbot. For some of the other characters, I did, um, I, I did imagine actors. Um, for when uh, there's an illustrated edition of the Murderbot Diaries from Subterranean Press, and the artist is Tom, Tommy Arnold. And to him, I did describe what I think Murderbot looks like and some of and, and the other characters. And he's got, I think he's got those images on his website and he, you know, he was selling the prints from the book. Uh, so those are probably pretty close to what my imagination is. is. Very cool, thank you. Um, so if you could pick any author, living or dead, to work with, is there anybody you would just immediately go and start writing with? Yeah, actually, I've got a lot of author friends that I would, I would not, I would love to work with. Um, uh, Nora Jemison, Kate Elliott. Uh, Nora and I's work is so different, and our, our approaches to our work is so different. It's just in the, 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 the way we actually write, I think that probably wouldn't work because we're just too, we're just too different. I think me and Kate Elliott might work better together, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of friends. I, I, I actually like, um, a long time ago when I was doing fan fiction, we used to write with other people and have a lot of fun, you know, working on helping each other with our stories and stuff. So, and I, and I, and I enjoyed working with, a, with, um, uh, my editor in Magic the Gathering quite a bit. So yeah, I always liked working with other people. Um, so if there was somebody who wanted to start writing sci-fi or fantasy, is there any advice that you would give them? And do you think that would differ at all if they were interested in a different genre? Uh, yeah, I think that when you work in genre, you really have to love it. I think because there's a lot of people who see genre as kind of a get rich quick thing. Well, this will be, e or think it will be easy. Um, and um, they, if they don't read it as a fan, there's just, they're just going to be things they don't know. And I think that's going to become obvious to the readers. Um, unless you're just, I mean, you can be a new fan, but if, unless you have that kind of like, ah, oh, I'm really excited by, you know, 
by science fiction or fantasy or romance or mystery or whatever, if you're not excited by it, you don't have to know everything about it. You don't have to read every book or whatever. But if you don't have that excitement and interest in it, I think that's going to come across to the reader. Yeah. Are there any other genres that you would have an interest in writing in at some point? Well, I've always kind of combined mystery with a lot of my stories, and I've combined romance mm -hmm. with a lot of my stories. I don't know if I, I, I'm just so, I don't know if I know how to write a book that didn't have either magic or, you know, super technology in it. So I, I don't think I would at this point. I mean, I don't think you should change. I think just, you know, like you said, add the mystery or add the romance, but keep those. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions that was submitted on our form was somebody asking if you would ever consider writing a sci-fi novel in a contemporary setting or a, a more a near future setting as opposed to a far future setting. Um, I don't know if I had an idea that worked for it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I probably would, but um, I just didn't. I I just really enjoy making up worlds from scratch too much. I think to kind of be too interested in a contemporary, more contemporary setting. Yeah. So who are, so I got back into sci-fi with you and Becky Chambers. Uh, so who are the other sci-fi and fantasy authors that we should all be reading today? Uh, definitely N.K. Jemison, um, Kate Elliott, um, Nevo, and that's spelled N-G-H-I-V-O, is his... She only has a few things out, uh, but they're all fabulous. She did um, The Chosen and the Beautiful, which is a retelling of The Great Gatsby. Um, uh, her upcoming one is Siren Queen, which is basically a very dark um, 1930s uh, pre-code Hollywood, but with fairy. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Um, K. Arsenault Rivera, who wrote The Tiger's Daughter. That's been one of my favorite fantasy novels in years. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, Elliot de Bodard, um, she writes a lot of novellas, um, science fiction and fantasy. Um, um, and I think she's, yeah, she's up for a Yugo this year too. Um, Let's see. Mary Robin at Kowal, the Lady Astronaut books. Those are really fabulous. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf over there. That's great. The, thank you. The uh, Fonda Lee does the, um, the Jade City trilogy. And it's basically, it's really cool. It's a fantasy set um, in a created, a created world. Uh, but it's in like the 80s instead of, and it really shows how basically this early, you know, sword and sorcery style world, how it grew up into what it is now and how um, um, the, the con how the contemporary world has affected their, their traditions and their magic and everything. And it's just really, it's just really excellent. Um, or you said Ancillary Justice and everything by Ann Leckie. Um, Sharon Shin has been one of my favorite fantasy writers for a long time. Uh, let's see. Oh, Karen Lord has done a couple of books. My favorite of hers is The Best of All Possible Worlds, which is science fiction. Um, let's see. Winter's Orbit by Ever Everina Maxwell. Um, P. Jelly Clark has also, he's done, he's, I think he's, he has a novel up for, yeah, for a Yugo, for you or never, uh, but his, his work, his fantasy is just really fantastic. Oh, and uh, Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho, which is actually contemporary fantasy. She's written some other secondary world fantasy, but uh, Blackwater Sister is really one of my favorites. It's about a young woman who um, comes back to Malaysia with her parents. She's college you know, college graduate, and so she's kind of feels a bit of fish out of water because she hasn't, I think she hasn't been there since she's a little kid, and ends up being haunted by her grandmother and having to kind of unravel this family history while uh, all this other stuff is going on. It's just an absolutely excellent book. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> um, so 
Can I ask if you remember what was your introduction to sci-fi or fantasy? And if you can remember the book, is it something you would still recommend today or is it something that it, of its time, but you know, moving on? Uh, probably, I, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, it was probably Andre Norton. I read a lot of um, children's fantasy that I don't remember really well. But Andre Norton was probably the first adult SF writer that I read, and now nowadays her book would probably be cast, or her books would probably be um, considered um, young adult. Um, I also read, you know, things like The Borrowers. I don't know if those are still out. It was mm -hmm. um, a series. I think it's by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Um, the, the first book was The Witch's Eye. Um, that was a really incredible book. And there's one I don't remember um, the title. I think I've got a copy of it somewhere, but I don't remember, I don't remember the title off the top of my head. I, I think it was A Walk Into Winter, something like that. Or, okay. And it was two kids that um, kind of blunder into a magical world and uh, end up having to kind of keep going in order to get out of it. And there's, you know, dwarves and elves and everything, but it's really, it's, it was really done really well. And that's probably one of my, um, the fact that I remember it all these years later is a really introdu big introduction to, you know, kind of more classic fantasy. Um, so yeah, and also I was really big into TV. I still am actually um, really liking the, um, the stuff that the end of what it was back before this is before cable and, and satellite and all that kind of thing so you had like five channels and the independent station would show um, old monster movies and kind of the Irwin Allen shows like Land of the Giants and Lost in Space and things like that and I was really into those. So I understand you can't give away things too much um, for upcoming things but uh, are there characters that we've met in the past in your books that maybe we'll get to see again in the future? And again, if you can't say, or if you don't know yet, I understand. Well, actually I'm working on another Murderbot novella right now, and it's actually gonna be set right after Network Effect. Okay. So um, hopefully that'll be finished in the next couple of months. It's like I, I told, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're getting ready to move to a new house. So, you know, everything is like in chaos right now. Why I'm working on another Murderbot novella. I've got a new fantasy novel coming out next year that I actually finished last year and it was supposed to come out this year, but with the supply chain issues and everything, it got moved back, but it's called Witch King and it's a new fantasy world and that'll be out probably May of next year. Okay. Is that one going to be a standalone or is it the beginning of a series? There's going to be a sequel to it. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, so some of uh, the, uh, one of the questions that somebody submitted was, do you have, other than Murder, Murderbot, of course, do you have another favorite robot or cyborg or AI from literature or TV? Um, I really liked um, um, the Star Wars movie. Um, was it Rogue? God, why can't I can't remember anything tonight. Rogue, Rogue One? One? Yeah, Rogue One. My husband just yelled it from the living room. <laughs> I really like the the robot that was played by Alan Tudyk. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought every look, everything on its face, and every everything it said was just hilarious. So that's probably one of my fa big favorites. Uh, let's see. So, do you approach your writing of sci-fi and fantasy differently at all, or is it pretty much once you're in the world, the same for you? It's pretty much the same. Um, I don't really, um, I get asked that question a lot and it really isn't any different for me. I get asked that question so much, I think maybe it should be, <laughs> but it actually, it is, it, it's pretty much exactly the same. What do you, in your mind, what is the difference between sci-fi and fantasy? I actually don't think there's that much difference. <laughs> um, it's in some ways they're marketing categories um and that's the difference it, it helps you kind of pick out what kind of book you want um the categories used to be a lot tighter um in i think the 90s and early 2000s 
I remember being on panels at conventions and people talking about the difference between heroic fantasy and um, sword and sorcery and high fantasy and, and epic fantasy. And it was like, you're splitting so, such hairs that it's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, uh, and I, and especially when the books I grew up reading in the seventies, um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, fantasy novels with technology and, uh, telepathy and things like that. And, and science fiction -y novels where people were space operas with magic and everything. So to me, there's really not that much of a difference. I think it just depends on, uh, probably the only thing that really sets that's really set apart like that is hard science fiction where, you know, everything is trying to be as scientifically accurate as possible. And Murderbot gets called that sometimes, but it's like Murderbot is not scientifically accurate at all. So I don't think it really belongs in that category. I'm gonna ask one more question from my list and then I'm gonna to move to uh, some of our audience submitted questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I do, I always like to ask authors, what is the last book that made you join the Bad Decision Book Club? which um, the book that made you stay up way too late when you, or when you should have been doing something else, but you just could not put it down. It's been a lot of books lately. Uh, Nettie Okorafor, and I should have listed her in the authors to recommend too. Um, um, I think it's Akata Warrior is the most recent book. There's a trilogy. I think it's Akata Witch. No, mm -hmm. it's Akata Woman. Akata Warrior and then Ak Akata Woman. And uh, that was really good. That kept me up late. Um, uh, ben Aronovich, the Rivers of London series. I absolutely love those books. So yeah, a lot of books will keep me up late reading. Sometimes it's just, I'm just so tired. I can't keep, <laughs> I, I can't stay up very long. Um, all right, so somebody asked, other than how to get away with murder, uh, do, what do you think would be Murderbot's favorite real show if if it were able to watch TV with us today? And they asked if it might possibly be Downton Abbey was their their suggestion. I don't know. I think there's too much relationship stuff in Downton Abbey. Murderbot also likes more mysteries and suspense, kind of a little bit of action. It likes the the drama, but it. It, I think it likes more of a combination. Um, for just outright silly fun, I think it would like Legends of Tomorrow. Um, for um, the other, I think that there's been some really good HBO ones, uh, particularly mysteries like um, uh, the Stephen King one, The Outsider. Uh, or in things like that, uh, Mayor of East Town. There's some really more. Um, um, I think Murderbot likes more, a, a little bit more uh, hard edged. I mean, it likes all kinds of stuff, but that's, I think, is, is more of its favorite. Let's see. A lot of people, we have a lot of questions submitted. People are very excited to hear from you. Uh, so somebody asked if there was any intention in making Murderbot autistic coded or deliberately familiar, familiar to an autistic reader, or was this just incidental? And they said, as an autistic person uh, who finds Murderbot immensely relatable. Well, um, I just wrote Murderbot the way I, a lot of that is how my brain works. So, uh, and I've never been diagnosed with anything because I'm at that age where back then, when I was growing up again in the 70s, they didn't, uh, especially, particularly girls, they didn't worry about, they didn't, you know, you were just behaving badly, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's just, that's just how my brain works and that's how it always has been. And that's why it came out like that. I wasn't intending it to be anything in particular, but now that I have so many comments about that, it's, I should probably go and, and uh, I know a lot of older people, particularly my age too, especially women who have gone back and, and gotten a diagnosis because they've realized that a lot of things they were just cope, they learned to cope with, you know, were probably, um, uh, actually should have been treated when they were when they were younger so yeah but it wasn't it wasn't intentional it's just me <laughs> somebody asked 
about, a couple of people have asked about Murderbot uh, being gender neutral or that they read Murderbot as female in their mind. Um, was there any difficulty or intention that you had to put into it in writing a character that was non-gendered? Um, <laughs> not really, because I just, when I was working on that part, at, you know, at the very beginning, I thought there's just no reason a company this callous would have bothered to give um, this being anything that it didn't actually, that wasn't practical. So it would not have, they would not, there's no way they would have um, put in any kind of programming or inclination to pick a gender or anything like that. Um, I'm not, that's just how I always saw Murderbot. So um, it is funny writing a non-gendered character, you do have to keep it in mind and you make a little mistakes and stuff um, because you're just so used to defaulting to a binary, a binary idea of gender. And you just kind of have to keep it in mind and go back over it and make sure you haven't screwed up. Makes sense. Um, so another question that's come up a couple of times is will three or the sec unit that does get, that Murderbot helps um, release, will we see three again? Yeah, three is gonna be in the next novella. I'm not sure to what extent yet. I'm still working on it, so. Okay, let's see. I'm excited, I liked the <laughs> uh, Let's see. Uh, so uh, this one's a little longer and it's about the rest. Were you, Re Rexura, am I saying that yeah, right? Yeah, it's just Rexura. Um, they, I love that the Rexura books are like the Bronte stories recast in Technicolor and a matriarchal society that exists alongside other social structures. Um, and that Murderbot comments on, on social and economic systems. How much of the literary and social commentary in your books is uh, planned and intentional and how much do you explore as you're going through? Um, a lot of it just comes up as I'm going through. It's like you kind of start doing something and you kind of realize um, what a commentary it is on, on our society or whatever. Um, some of it's intentional. Um, I'd seen a discussion on Twitter about um, the idea of making fantasy cities um, so kind of depressing and um, stratified and, and kind of imagining different things. And I'm like, okay. And I was getting ready to do a, a new city a landscape basically for um, the Harbors of the Sun, I think it was. And I thought, well, I, what? Why can't this fantasy city just be, why can't it have healthcare and mass transportation? And, and when I kind of went with those ideas, it was really fun to kind of come, especially the mass transportation, what would that look like with magic and everything? Um, I've done that before, uh, particularly Wheel of the Infinite has, um, you know, they, at one point they go into basically a free hospital. Um, and, and basically it's, the discussion on Twitter was basically taking the idea of, um, things that we're hoping to work toward now or that, that should be rights or available to, to everyone is making kind of normalizing those things in our books and acting like, like it's not some weird thing that no humans have ever wanted before, but actually showing like, yeah, these things turn up all the time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked if you have a, uh, one of your books that's just in your heart as like your favorite book of yours. It's usually the one um, I'm working on at that point because, <coughs> excuse me again, you really have to kind of fall in love with the book while you're working on it. Um, I've had ones I've fallen out of love with midway through because of whatever else was going on in my life I just had to persevere with and they were very difficult. Um, so when you're working on a book and you by the end of it you're still happy with it, um, and you don't think it's just a big pile of crap. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, a lot of times, you, especially something that's been very complicated, you can't see the forest for the trees by that point. And it really takes a while before you can get any perspective on it and see, you know, whether, you know, you do like what you've done. But the book that you're still happy with when you finish it, that's usually, uh, that kind of situation is my favorite. And it's, and it's varied between books, you know, over the years. Uh, so along with the earlier question about seeing three again, will we ever see the sex bot um, 
from oh book uh, two, two i think it's two, yeah article to condition um i don't have any plans for that right now but i sure i, I wouldn't say no you know because that might happen right, of course uh so somebody did ask if you know spending all this time with these characters do they ever like creep into your dreams are they just with you all the time um i don't usually dream about my characters that's really odd I, i'll dream about stuff you know incorporate stuff that happens um um and i'll dream about other books i read but i don't usually dream about my books it's like it's a my brain is processing that in a different place Some of these that were asked have already asked, so I'm just going through. Um, can you give us any um, inkling on what might be next for Murderbot? Again, understanding you might not be able to tell us that or just may not want to. Well, it's, it, it's, it takes place after Network Effect, and basically it's about basically continuing to work on that planet and to try to um, ameliorate that situation, if that's the right word, that situation with the colonists that they're in at that point. Okay. So just make sure I understand. It'll actually be, we'll, we'll go kind of like back in time just a little bit then? Yeah, Fugitive Telemetry is actually set before Network Effect. Oh, yeah. you know what? Yeah, I get that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why that didn't occur to me before. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, I wish they'd put it on the book somewhere. Um, but yeah, it was kind of, it's, it's set between exit strategy and network effect. And that's just because I didn't get the idea for it until after sure. I the network effect. Um, so um, yeah, so this will just be a sequel. It'll, it'll, it's kind of in this, in, it's just right after network effect. So it, okay. it's informed by that. Interesting. Um, so somebody asked, uh, Murderbot has obviously gone through trauma. And did you do any research into how an individual might deal with prolonged PTSD since it does, their trauma, its trauma does seem to come back occasionally? Yeah, that was, that was, again, that was just me. That was like drawing from my own experiences. Okay. And, um, time for a couple more. People are very excited. They keep sending you more questions. Um, so has Murderbot ever heard of Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics? No, probably not. <laughs> what would Murderbot think of Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics? I'd probably think that would be a really great idea if a corporation would actually abide by that. <laughs> but yeah, that's not likely to happen. I like that. Let's see. Um... Oh, so... Uh, both artificial condition and network effect reference Murderbot needing recharge cycles. Is that similar to how a human would sleep, or is it different? Do they how what does it look like, and how often does Murderbot need those? Um, not too often. It depends a lot on what it's been doing, um, and it's basically it's kind of almost like going into a low power mode to let the battery cycle. Um, that's as technical as I can probably get with it. Yeah. Uh, so somebody said that they realized after reading All Systems Red, they had been picturing you as the character of Mensa the whole way through. <laughs> and I was wondering if you, A, how do you picture Mensa? And also B, is there a particular character that you do feel is you in the books? No, I don't feel any character is me. Uh, I don't, I don't put myself in my books like that. Um, I've always, Mensa, I had uh, in mind Viola Davis, actually, from How to Get Away with Murder. That makes sense. Uh, I've kind of, once you start writing that you can, a lot of times I start out with an actor act, and then I kind of, it changes as you go along, they kind of become looking more like just themselves, you know. Um, but yeah, no. <laughs> Hey, if somebody wants to picture you as Dr. Mensa, you, Viola Davis, I mean, why not? Yeah. Why not? Um, so I pretty much ending our time that we've uh, uh, asked you to be here, and I don't want to keep you too late, but uh, just if there's anything else you wanted to share with readers about things that are coming up, 
Um, otherwise, just thank you so much for being here today. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you about your wonderful writing. Well, thank you. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else except, you know, the, the Witch King will be out in May 2023. And I think this Murderbot novella is supposed to be out in later in 2023 also, but I'm not exactly sure. Okay. About it. And oh, somebody did ask if you could repeat the title of the London books, London oh, books? Yeah, Rivers of London by Ben Aronovich. And it's a, it's a contemporary fantasy mystery series. Excellent, thank you. Thank you again so much, Martha. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm gonna turn off the recording. Thank you all for coming today. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.